I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to uh, Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 921, page 921, and you'll be able to find Jonah chapter 4. And as always, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. Just take one of those with you. It's our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. Uh, and, and if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible, ask for one. We'll get you one because we want everyone to have the Word of God because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, some of you are, are probably wondering why I'm wearing a San Diego State University shirt up here. And uh, because right now they're playing in the Final Four, like as in right now. And, uh, and last week I was having a conversation with uh, uh, Joe and Patty right over here. And they're San Diego State fans. I go, it's cool, I'm pulling for San Diego State. They're underdogs, they're West Coast teams. And, and, uh, I, and they go, yeah. And I said, if they make the Final Four, I'll wear a shirt if you get me one. And they got me one. <laughs> I have made that offer to so many people through the years about jerseys and shirts, first time. But by the way, if you know who wins, hey. If you know who wins, don't tell them. They've taped it. By the way, they're here and their team is playing. That's, I, I appreciate that devotion. I appreciate that devotion. So don't tell them because uh, they want to know. Uh, and uh, uh, whether you want to offer them congratulations or condolences, just keep your mouth shut. Uh, <laughs> and uh, show them some grace. Hey, by the way, uh, it's already been mentioned, uh, Easter is next weekend. And so I'm excited. Are you guys excited? It's going to be awesome, and uh, we're going to have two services on Saturday. You guys are already here on Saturday, so praise God. Uh, but we're going to have a 3.30 and a 5. So uh, if half of you would come at 3.30 and half at 5, because I'm just telling Sunday morning to show up on Saturday. And they don't know which service. We don't have one dedicated for them. So uh, you, some of y'all can come earlier. That'd be great. Uh, bring your friends, bring your family, bring the people you're going to invite, because that's what uh, we're doing and by having an extra service. We know people are going to show up. But we also want uh, everyone to invite. That's why we have the invite cards. There's still some left if you haven't gotten them. Grab some of those. Uh, spoke to a man right before the service, and he just goes, I did something I've never done before. I invited my family uh, and all their kids and all this. And I was like, that is so awesome. We have no idea whether they're, whether they're going to show up or not. But see, that's in God's hands. And he was obedient, and that was, uh, that was really cool. So uh, invite somebody. Even if you've never done it before, you can do it. It's possible. And, uh, and look, you got to see uh, a dedication of, a proclamation of a life given to Jesus tonight in the waters of baptis baptism. And we've already got a bunch of people signed up for Easter baptisms. I think all the services are going to have baptisms. And if you're sitting here thinking, I should do that. I know I should do that. I've been thinking about doing that. I need to do that. Uh, let us help you. Okay? Anytime, any place, there's water in a crowd. We're in. I can't think of a better time than Easter when we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus who, who gives us life and hope. So let us know. Grab a Connect card. Uh, find us after the service. We've got, uh, we got sign-ups out in the foyer. We'd be glad to sign you up. So Easter is coming, and we're excited. But I'm excited right now. You guys excited? You seem to be excited, so let's, let's, let's do this. Have you ever noticed, speaking of excitement, how annoying the world can be? I mean, have you just noticed that? I mean, it's, it's annoying all the time. Like you're driving down the highway and there's nobody around, right? Nobody on the road. Maybe it's early morning, maybe it's late at night, and the stupid light turns red, <laughs> right? And there's not anybody there. And you're just like, why did it turn red? And then you sit there and sit there. And sit. That is annoying. Anybody with me on that? Yeah. It's just like, come on, what's up with that? And then, and then just the fact that chocolate, or even worse, ice cream, tastes so good it makes you fat. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, Brussels sprouts are good for you, and they taste like Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I mean, it's just annoying. Why does it have to be that way? So the world we live in is an annoying place, uh, but, you know, people can be annoying too. All right? Have you guys noticed that? Like, like people who have nothing to say, who love to talk? If you don't know who you are, that's okay. We love you. <laughs> or, or what are the people who are on their cell phone and seem like they don't, or, or they're not aware that there's anybody else around them? You know, in a restaurant, in an elevator, 
You know, and public transportation on the plane, waiting to take off, it's kind of like, hey, you know, there's other people around you. But, uh, am I the only one who finds that annoying? Uh, any, anyone else? Okay. So, um, for me personally, and, and, and I just apologize, but sl- the, my two biggest annoyances, slow drivers and slow golfers. <laughs> That's it. And I know that I'm annoying to the people who are slow drivers, okay? So I just apologize right now. I, I'm not cursing you or anything. I'm just praying for you. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> That's okay. I just, I can't help it. I've got an internal, you know, motor that's just moving at a certain speed. So I can't, it's hard for me to slow down. But um, see, I, I, what I'd love for you to do is just like turn to your neighbor and tell them the one thing that drives you crazy. It's most annoying, but we don't have time for that, do we? You guys can do that over dinner uh, afterwards or in life group. You guys should like share that as a question. What annoys you? So the world can be an annoying place. People can be annoying. And truthfully, and maybe surprisingly, God can be annoying. Maybe you think that's sacrilege to even say that, but, you know, let's, let's be honest. Sometimes God annoys us. I mean, he saves people who don't deserve it. I mean, I know none of us deserve it. I mean, you know that, and you and I know that. We all, we all know that it's only by grace we're saved, that through faith, that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. We know we don't deserve heaven, and we get it, and so we, we love grace, but there are some people who really don't deserve it. You know what I'm saying? Right? It's kind of annoying. Oh, they're going to be in heaven too. All right, it's a good thing... Good thing God's going to teach me how to love them there. Uh, And then it's annoying that God teaches us lessons we don't want to learn. Right? I mean like patience. Right? Forgiving people. Patience. Self-control. Patience. Did I mention that, you know, slow drivers and slow golfers? Anyway, uh, I have lots of time to talk to God about patience. Uh, But... uh, or, or how about uh, the promise that God will never leave us or forsake us? Now, if you're lonely, if you're hurting, if you're grieving, if you're afraid, that's a beautiful promise. But it is incredibly annoying when you want to go revisit your old sin habits and the Holy Spirit won't stay at home. You know what I'm talking about. So Jonah chapter 4 is all about God's annoying grace. Annoying grace. And it's about how Jonah dealt with it. And honestly, we can learn a lot from Jonah's example. So Jonah chapter four, uh, actually I'm gonna pick up the last verse of chapter three because it kind of sets the table for Jonah's uh, experience in chapter four. So if if you're catching up with us and you haven't been with us, Jonah chapter one, Jonah is told by God to go preach to Nineveh. He doesn't want to, so he goes the opposite direction, gets on a ship, God causes a storm, the sailors are panicking, uh, Jonah tells them, if you wanna calm the storm, throw me overboard, they throw him overboard. The, the storm calms, the sailors worship God. Jonah thinks he's dead, because he's gonna drown. A giant fish swallows him, so now he thinks he's really gonna be dead, but he's not, and he's alive, and he's in this fish for a couple of days, three days, and, and he prays out of desperation to God, and God does this miraculous thing, and the fish vomits Jonah out. Then he goes to Nineveh, reluctantly, but he goes, and he preaches, and the people all repent. And here's what verse 10, chapter 3 says. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord. Not a bad thing to do when you're angry, by the way. But he prayed to the Lord and he said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew, I just knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. He's praying it like that's a bad thing. (laughs) Therefore, now, O Lord, please kill me. Take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city because he's still hoping that they will be destroyed. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. 
And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. (laughs) And the Lord said, let me get this straight. You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh? that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. First, let me just welcome you to Jonah's pity party. Because that's what we just read. I mean, that was Jonah's prayer pity party. I mean, he's complaining to God about God. God, you showed mercy towards Nineveh. I mean... He's angry about God's amazing grace. He complains about the vine dying, the wind blowing. He complains about not getting his way. And two times he says, I want to die. Have you ever been there? I mean, seriously, when you look at your life and all you see is failure and disappointment and outcomes you didn't want, have you ever gotten angry at God because you didn't get what you wanted, because you didn't get what you prayed for, because your life is consumed by grief, pain, anger, or vengeance? and you feel like God is not helping you at all. I mean, twice God asked Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Some other translations put it this way. Is it right for you to be angry? Do you have a good reason to be angry? What right do you have to be angry? See, at at that moment, Jonah did not see any of his blessings. He didn't recognize any of God's goodness. He didn't appreciate any of God's redemption. So he complained, he whined, and he just gave up. It is a quintessential pity party. This from a man that God greatly used. I mean, seriously, Jonah might have preached the single greatest revival in the history of the world. 120,000 decisions. That's incredible. I mean, we're talking about in one service. We're not talking about like a lifetime. We're talking about right then, right there. Uh, And he's having a pity party. So how does this all happen? Well, just to be blunt, Jonah did God's will without experiencing God's joy. Jonah did God's will, but he did not experience any of God's joy. And this is so tragic because Jonah experienced this direct call from God. A lot of us would go like, hey, God, could you be that clear in my life? And then, because he disobeyed, he experienced this incredible, miraculous, you know, discipline, and then an even greater miraculous deliverance from it. And then he went and and did what God told him to do, and he experienced these unbelievable results like never before in the history, never since. And, And he does all of this without indicating any joy whatsoever. Instead, he just wants to die. So how did a God follower miss the joy of serving in God's power that was so incredible? I mean, how did did that even happen? Here's Jonah, a prophet of God, a man who's dedicated his life to God. How does he completely and totally miss out on the joy of God while he's serving God? Probably the same way that we do. So if you're a follower of Jesus, if, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then uh, it is possible for us to obey God's commands and still not experience God's joy. It's possible. I've seen it in many churches that I've been in. People living out their faith with zero celebration. Christians reluctantly obeying God out of obligation. Pastors dutifully preaching without the expectation of power. I mean, I pretty much define the churches I grew up in. I mean, I got in trouble for having fun in church my entire childhood. I mean, you know, there were, hey, look, nobody ever laughed in churches that I grew up in. If they did, they usually got in trouble. I know I did. And, and, and the only time you could ever, you know, actually have some semblance of fun was either if it was a youth trip away from the church where you wondered, why can't we do this at church? Or if you were having a fellowship on Sunday night and even then the humor was eh. <laughs> 
By the way, that's why contagious celebration is one of Calvary's core values. Because we believe that following Jesus actually results in a joy-filled life, and that joy-filled life draws other people to Jesus. That's what we want to happen in our lives. But there's a lot of people who actually try to do God's will, but there's, abs- there's no joy. They're like, okay, we've got to do this. We've got to keep going. I remember uh, in my early days at Calvary, you know, we were really traditional, little Baptist church. And so we had Monday night visitation. Anyone else ever been afflicted with Monday night visitation? Yes, I see those hands. We have a therapy group later on. Uh, if you don't know what Monday night visitation is, it's, it's a great thing from the 1950s that uh, we shouldn't have been doing in 1992, but we still were. And we were showing up, and if you visited the church, and they'd give out cards to people, and you go, okay, now just show up at their door and knock on their door and say, hi, I'm from Calvary. <laughs> There's groaning over here. <laughs> that's right, that's right. We groaned too, but we went because we were supposed to because that's the godly thing to do. And there was... There was a gentleman that was part of that, and he was never, I never saw him smile, but he was faithful. He was always there. I'll go visit people. I'll tell them they're going to hell. (laughs) I think he liked that part. But anyway, the, you know, we just, so it can happen to us. It can, you know, this joyful life in Christ can become this burden, obligation that that we feel like, oh, I have to do this and there's no joy. So here's what I think happened to Jonah and and it can happen to us. And, And that is that Jonah didn't understand God's heart. He just didn't understand God's heart. He followed God without really sharing God's passion or knowing God's desire. And so he missed the blessing of doing God's will. So, here's, by the way, this is the question I really want you to wrestle with this week. I really hope you and the Holy Spirit have a conversation about this throughout the week. And, And the question is simply this. So, do you get God's heart? Do you understand what Scripture teaches is God's will for us versus our wants for us? Now, in Jonah chapter four, I think there are three obvious contrasts that demonstrate the disconnect between God's heart and Jonah's desires. And I think a lot of times we, get, we can fall into these same disconnects. We can fall into the same traps. We kind of know what God's will is over here, but we do something completely different. And that means that we try to do God's will without experiencing any of his joy. So the first one is this. God's heart is mercy instead of destruction. God's heart is mercy instead of destruction. Uh, did you notice Jonah and his uh, desire for destruction? When God saw uh, what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. Why was he angry? Because he wanted them to be destroyed. He hated the Assyrians. He hated the Ninevites. He wanted to see their destruction. He did not want to warn them, which is why he said, that's why I went to Tarshish, because you, I knew what kind of a God you are. You're forgiving, you're merciful. No. I don't want them to experience your mercy. You see, the Assyrians were Israel's enemies. I mean, and the Assyrians were cruel and threatening, and they committed all kinds of atrocities, and Jonah wants them to suffer. I'm glad we never feel that way about our enemies. Oh, you guys are sometimes tempted to do that too. I mean, come on. We often root for the destruction of our enemies. We're guilty of anger toward political opponents. Sometimes we cheer for our rival's failure. Or maybe we just want to do better than our siblings. See, when our hearts are angry or bitter or vengeful, we do not share God's heart. When our hearts are angry and bitter and vengeful, we're not imitating Jesus. You see, God is the just judge and he will hold everybody accountable and he chooses to offer us mercy, which is a really good thing because without God's mercy, we're all going to hell. Every single one of us. See, God's heart is revealed in mercy because 
Look, we deserved hell, but we get to go to heaven because he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for your sins and my sins so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be forgiven, so that we can have a relationship with him, so that we get mercy instead of the destruction that we deserve. Amen. See, yeah, that's what mercy is all about. That's why Paul says, look, don't take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God for vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. That's the justice piece. No, instead, what are we supposed to do? If your enemy is hungry, Feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. That's what we're supposed to do. That's mercy. So follow God's heart. Forgive and you'll be set free to live in joy. So God's heart is mercy instead of destruction and God's heart is compassion instead of complaining. <laughs> Jonah had zero compassion for the Ninevites, but he complained about everything. Did you catch that? He complained about God sparing the city from destruction. He complained about the vine dying and having a hot breeze. He complained so much, he said, I want to die. Might have been the world's biggest whiner as well as the greatest preacher. See, God's heart is for people. Matthew chapter 9 tells us that Jesus had compassion on the crowds when he saw them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus saw us, saw the crowds, and he had compassion on them. That's why Jesus healed people. That's why Jesus taught people. That's why Jesus fed people. That's why Jesus prayed for people. That's why Jesus went to the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. Because he wanted to save people. Plain and simple. If we want to know God's heart, we have to embrace compassion instead of complaining. So how do we do that in a privileged and spoiled culture? Because we're products of our culture and we are privileged and we are spoiled. And uh, it's a culture, let's face it, that, that excels in complaining. I think that you can get college credit for that now. <laughs> well, if you want to have compassion instead of complaining, you gotta embrace the two Bs. First of all, be grateful. Be grateful, see your blessings, recognize God's goodness, praise God for salvation, because you don't deserve it. Praise God for your health. You go, but I'm sick. Yeah, but you're not dead. Praise God for your relationships. You go, yeah, but you don't know my husband or my wife. Do you have a relationship? <laughs> It'll change if you start praising God for it. Praise God for you know, the, the love that fills your life, for laughter. Praise God for heaven, because that's what's next. So if you're miserable right now, just praise God anyway because heaven is what's coming and you know, we go, well, you know, it's better than the alternative that you're still here. No, it's not, but the alternative we have to wait for. And when we get there, you're gonna go, this is awesome. So, you know, be grateful. I have to confess, it amazes me at the lack of gratitude that we can have. And we call ourselves followers of Jesus. So be grateful, and second B, be aware. If you wanna have compassion, be aware that everyone has pain, not just you. Everyone is hurting, everyone struggles. Look, if you just focus only on your pain and your struggles and your grief and don't care about others' pain, then you're gonna live a sad, lonely life. Miserable, angry. See, God cares, he cares for everyone. That includes you. God cares for you. And as God's people, guess what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to care for everyone, not just ourselves. And the more compassion you have for others, the less complaining you're gonna do. Let me say that again. The more compassion you have for others, the more awareness that you have uh, that other people are struggling and other people are hurting and other people are, are, are having difficulties too, the less complaining you're gonna do. Because you're gonna be focused on trying to help them through their struggles rather than just obsessing on your own struggles. So God's heart is compassion instead of complaining. And, and God's heart is salvation instead of selfishness. Did you catch verse 10 and 11? And the Lord said to Jonah, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh? that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't have a clue. You see, Jonah was more concerned with his comfort than people's salvation. 
Let me say it again. Jonah was more concerned with his personal comfort than the salvation of 120,000 people in Nineveh. If we are more concerned with our comfort, with our preferences, with our agenda than God's mission, we will miss the heart of God and actually we'll be following Jonah, not Jesus. See, God is so committed to saving people that he sacrificed Jesus to rescue us. And as his children, he wants us to embrace his mission and share his heart to see people experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus. So have you experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Yes. Are you excited about the, the way that Jesus fills and changes your life? Yes. Do you want anyone else to experience that? Yes. Okay, well then this, is, this point's for you. Because you're going to like it. If you didn't say yes, then you're going to struggle. So, now, this doesn't mean that you have to quit your job and become a preacher. Okay, it doesn't mean that you have to go to the mission field. It's not a bad idea, but it's, you know, it doesn't mean you have to do that. You don't even have to be the John 3.16 guy at the football games. And if you don't know who that guy is, then see me afterwards, I'll explain it. It does mean that we care about people's eternal destiny more than our comfort and our preferences. So I'm going to be a bit prophetic, which just means Bible talk for mean, okay? Um, if you come into church, can you rejoice if somebody's sitting in your seat? <laughs> can you be like, hey, wow, new people are here. Yay, that's great. Or do you sit and stew because they're in your seat? <laughs> if you're complaining that somebody sat in your seat and I hear you, I will rebuke you. If you ask them to move out of your seat, I will excommunicate you. Okay? Because that's all about preference and not people. Um, can you worship God even if the annoying guy sits in front of you? Even if the parents with the baby sit behind you? Can you worship God even if they don't play your song? Or if it's too loud? Okay, so if you're not a visitor, why are you parking in guest parking? I mean, I'm just, isn't that about our preferences and our comfort versus other people? And do you value your vine? Oh, sorry, that's Jonah. Do you value your hobby or your car or your boat or your pet more than people's eternal fate? Okay. I mentioned the pet thing because uh, the one thing I've, the one thing that has, I've gotten the most negative feedback ever when I preached was when I said that your pet's not going to heaven. <laughs> See, right now, some people are like, <laughs> look, there's going to be animals in heaven. It's, but it's a new creation. It's a new heaven and a new earth and, and, and different animals because the lion and the lamb are going to lay down together and babies are going to play with cobras. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you're, some of you are like, hey, I don't want to go there. Uh, <laughs> yes, you do. You don't get it yet. But see, here's the thing. Jesus died to save people. We're the ones made in God's image. We're the ones he came to redeem. And, and look, sin-tainted animals just aren't going to make it. Look, I, I, don't, I don't know about your dog, but my dog's not going to be in heaven. Because any dog that eats its own poop is not going to make it. <laughs> All right? Just saying. And, and, and I've had people, like, just try to convince me otherwise. And, and here's the thing. I don't really care if you don't agree with me about animals, your pets making it to heaven. And, and many of you hope I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'll repent, okay? It's heaven. I'll be there. I don't care. <laughs> what bothers me is this. We get more upset about our pets not going to heaven than we do about our neighbors going to hell. And that just means we're Jonah. And we're missing God's heart. God's grace is amazing. It's wonderful. It's available. And it's annoying. And I want you and everyone in Havasu and Parker and really to the ends of the earth to, to know the mercy of God and experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus. So hopefully, I'll see you next Saturday or Sunday. Hopefully Saturday. 
And I'll see you with your family and your friends and your neighbors or maybe even your enemies because that would be pleasing to God. So let's follow the example of Jesus and not Jonah if we want to live in the joy of our Savior. Will you pray with me? Father, you know us and yet you still love us. You know us and you pursued us from heaven. You know us and you sent Jesus to die for us in all of our faithlessness, in all of our filth, in all of our rebellion and defiance. You still want to forgive us and to make us yours. So Father, we say thank you. We love you and we give ourselves to you. We can do nothing else. We have nowhere else to go. Jesus is our savior and, and God, we want you to change our hearts so that we can be like him, so that we can have this, so we can have his heart and the joy of being your children. So show us what that looks like in our lives because Father, right now we're ready to repent and follow you no matter the cost, in Jesus' name, amen.